Good morning, Illini Nation, and the sweetest Sunday we've had as a fan base since 2005. Illinois basketball is back in the Sweet 16 with a 89-63 victory over the Duquesne Dukes. And what a performance it was. It was a performance that, from start to finish, was just perfect. So... I am so happy about this line of basketball team. Brad Underwood finally got the monkey off of his back. He's finally coaching in the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. And uh, Sonny, what are your initial impressions of last night's game and the season at large? I mean, what a relief. You know, it's, uh, we talk about it, you know, we deal with, uh, you know, just as fans, you know, it, it's silly to think that we share the burden with the basketball team. But in our own little worlds, in our own little perspectives, that's essentially what we do. Like, you know, when we're interacting with our friends or family and, you know, it's fun to talk sports. It's fun to, you know, talk, do a little ribbing back and forth with uh, fan bases with other teams. And the one comeback that they always tended to have was, you know, yeah, we'll make a second weekend first, make a second weekend first. And the fact that, you know, that we can put that soundly to the, to bed now that argument um it was such a relief you know i know last night uh, usually we do these post game recaps immediately after uh, the game but yesterday i just wanted to kind of just savor it i just wanted to kind of enjoy i was hanging out with uh, you know a couple of buddies who are also illinois fans and you know i'm at the age now where we don't i know not to take this for granted i know like this is you know truly special like we're a fantastic program, but we're not the Dukes and the UNCs who make Sweet 16s, you know, on an annual basis. So the fact that we're there now is, again, not to sound cliche, but just such a sweet feeling. I was in fifth grade the last time Illinois made a second weekend in the NCAA tournament. I am 30 years old right now. That's the difference in, in where I was in fifth grade versus now a married man like that's just crazy to think of all the life that I've gone through where Illinois hasn't played in the second weekend in the NCAA tournament which seems crazy but Illinois is finally back there and like I was looking at my emails one day and I saw that game day spirit had a March Bradness t-shirt and I was like uh but I really want to buy that with the uh, Brad Underwood's history in the NCAA tournament and now I'm like, I can finally get that shirt because yeah. it it actually makes sense because he's in the second weekend where, again, anything can happen. And I, it's just mind blowing to me the how this team has bonded and gelled through three iterations of the team and how they're at this step right here. I mean, you'd look at the pre Shannon suspension where things were great. You lost to Tennessee. Um, and you're like, Oh dang, can't beat an elite team. Then Terrence gets suspended and the team rallies around Marcus Damask and booty ball and plays a completely different style. Then there was a regelling portion with getting Terrence back in the fold. And now it feels like this is peak Illini basketball right now that they're playing. And I look at Iowa state and we'll get to it in in a different episode, but I'm not scared of any opponent because of the performances that Terrence Shannon has played. It reminds me a lot of cardiac Kemba um, back in Yukon where he was just taking over every single game. It didn't matter the opponent. He was going to find a way for the Yukon Huskies to win those games. And Terrence Shannon probably didn't need a superhero effort against Duquesne, but if he keeps this up, I, I'm not scared of any team remaining in this tournament. I said that earlier, you know, like it's unfortunate that Terrence uh, didn't get what he deserved uh, being a first team All-American, but you saw his tweet immediately afterwards that, yeah, he deleted it uh, shortly thereafter, but he saw it and, you know, he feels spurned. And it's one of those moments where ultimately it might have been the best thing to happen to Illini basketball. I kind of equate it to, uh, we're going off tracks here, the movie Troy. When uh, Hector accidentally kills uh, Achilles' uh, cousin and the king basically says, you know, that act may have just won us the war. And in a lot of ways, you know, that's just kind of what just happened. It's a, 
Terrence has been a man amongst boys. He's always been. He's always been bigger and stronger and faster than most of the guys that he's on the court with. But, you know, a lot of the season we're kind of debating who the alpha guy is on this team, who, who's 1A, 1B between Domask. And quite honestly, we just have two 1As. We have two guys who are really, really good basketball players. And Terrence Shannon Jr., I'll, again, Zach Eady is the best player in the country, sure. But right now, Terrence Shannon Jr. is playing like the best player in the country. He's a two-way guy. He's, you know, he has a an assignment on defense, and he's instructed to shut them down. And for the most part, that's what he does. Tominaga had zero answer for him uh, in the Big Ten tournament. And uh, it's just, again, it's nice to see for this team, just because they, they're gelling so well. You know, we've talked about it all season long. Last team, last year's team, we kind of just liked them because they're the Illini. They're representing us. But the parts didn't exactly fit. Like, you didn't get the best vibes off this team. But now it seems, you know, every post game, you know, this team is having fun in the locker room. They're, you know, congratulating each other. We all saw the thumbnail that I have for this video, you know, the water gun fight. The boys are just having fun, and they're super easy to root for, and, you know, it's just all full steam ahead at this point. I mean, the gelling is a crucial factor in making deep March runs. With the Matthew Meyer team, yeah, they would give each other high fives after big plays and everything, but it never felt like a true unified experience. There was infighting. This year's team, it's more of a fraternity brotherhood um, that you see where guys are supporting each other. Like you just see it with NIL shirts, like guys wearing the, each other's uh, shirts and everything. I mean, it's just fun to see. And when a basketball team is having fun in this pressure filled environment, that's where the level of danger for other teams rises up a notch because it doesn't look like Illinois is playing with any pressure right now. Like it, even when they were down against uh Moorhead state, they didn't look defeated. They were just like, yeah, slow start. They made three straight three pointers. We'll be fine. Like there's hardly ever any, in any, any mistrust with each other and with the coaching staff. I mean, you look at the big 10 tournament, there were ample opportunities where Illinois should have been eliminated, but they weren't, they were just like, all right, we'll regel. We'll, we'll be fine. And they were, and this team just continues to find unique ways to win. And Terrence Shannon obviously is a part of that, but a different guy steps up every single night um, outside of Terrence Shannon Jr. And last night it was uh, Marcus Damask with 22 points. And But I do forget that he had the quietest triple-double of all time in <laughs> round one. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, we do have a couple of comments. Justin Verdon checking in. Thanks for watching, Justin. Justin says, good morning, gentlemen, and a good morning to you, Justin. Uh, a sweet morning. Uh, I got to stop doing that. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Check it out. Seven says, uh, I heard news about Illinois picking up a new recruit for next year. Jake Davis played at Mercer. Brad is already working the portal. Yeah, I've heard I've kind of heard the same thing and not uh, about any particular player, but um, if you have gather... season for that, even while you're coaching in an NCAA tournament, you've got to be uh, monitoring the portal. Um, you, after you got doused with uh, water guns, yeah. I'm sure he was uh, making some calls afterwards being like, hey, you guys want to be in a sweet 16 next year? Right. How brain dead uh, is the NCAA? Just like there's zero logic in how this whole process works where these guys are coaching and game planning for sweet 16s and potentially elite eights. And also, by the way, you know, try to figure out who on their team's leaving and, uh, you know, how many scholarships that they have to offer. But uh, check it out. Like, we'll definitely kind of go over um, some of our targets at some point um, in a later show. Uh, again, I've heard 15, 20 guys that Illinois has already um, kind of checked in on. And what we do know is Brad works the portal. You know, that's, again, that's something that we as Illini fans need to be super grateful for because there's other coaches with – more esteemed reputations who their fan bases are getting frustrated with them just because they haven't adapted to this part of game part of the game. And I don't know if I can name two or three coaches who've adapted themselves better than Brad to this portion. And that's again, you know, I guess we can talk about, you know, Brad Underwood for a little bit, Austin. It's this is why 
you know, I, I send out the hashtag thank you, Brad, uh, you know, um, tweet every now and then. It's just I'm super happy for the guy because I think he's been a fantastic coach. You know, he's entering the conversation now. Not, I don't think he's quite there yet, but he's entering the conversation as the best Illinois uh, basketball coach of all time. Um, we'll see what he does, you know, uh, in the remaining couple of weeks uh, this season. And hopefully my hope is uh, the burden has been lifted. You know, like it's no second week, second week in Brad. It's uh, if he can make it this year, which he has, I'm hoping this means moving forward, the pressure to make it to the second week and won't be as daunting because he's already done it before. And, you know, again, I, I'm a big Brad guy and I'm just, if, if nothing else, you know, when it comes to Shannon and Brad, like those two people are just someone I'm really excited for. Yeah, I mean, you look at what Jay Wright did at Villanova, where people's brackets in the early 2010s were like, all right, which which team is going to beat Villanova? Which team is going to beat Villanova? Which team is going to beat Villanova? And it was rinse, wash, and repeat. And... I was afraid that the same thing was going to happen with Brad Underwood. I know that there are some years that he made the NCAA tournament for Illinois with the Loyola year, with the Houston year, with the Arkansas year, um, losing, losing, and losing. But for to have a team this dominant again and for him to lose in the first weekend would have been super devastating. But this year's team is much better than last year's team. It's much better than the team two years ago, just with the myriad of ways that Illinois can score. and he made it he's done it and now Iowa State is gonna it's gonna be a pressure-filled environment in Boston but my goodness uh he made it so I I think we can finally uh put to rest any uh hot seat issues with Brad Underwood I think those are officially dead and I think he's closer to a lifetime contract a la Bill Self uh range rather than hot seat and if he makes some noise, maybe makes it to an elite eight. I think uh, Josh Whitman might be having those conversations with uh, the board of trustees on how a lifetime contract could work for Brad Underwood. Yeah, it's it's, it's a rough morning for the Brad haters, um, you know, of which there, of course, which there I mean, are I some. was one. I was one back yeah. in the day. Like after the Loyola loss, I was like, this might be the death nail in the Illini program, like where you had Io, you had Kofi, and they lost. Um, but this year's group has, and this year's group and the way he's, um, changed the transfer portal with how he recruited those transfers has just been unreal. Um, I think last year he went for like top free agent available essentially. And this year the fits have just been amazing. I know Justin Harmon hasn't had the best end of the season run and the postseason run. Um, he played 18 minutes, didn't score a point last night. But Quincy Garrier has had extreme flashes of greatness uh, in an Illini uniform. And then Marcus Damask, I mean, the guy is almost a third-team All-American um, if you were to re regrade everything after the postseason. So the way he's developed his transfer portal additions from one season to the next shows he's adapting to this new world of college basketball, and he's one of the very few coaches doing it. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, Brad's checking in. I think Shannon is going to have to carry uh, Illinois versus Iowa State. I'm afraid they have the guys to stop Domask's uh, booty ball. That's fine. Yeah, that's I, fine. I think like, that's, can, can do it. That's the that's a beauty of this team. Like we can play three, four, five different styles of basketball, and that's what makes the Illini such a daunting task for whoever we go up against. Because we will adjust when it comes to our offensive scheme. Okay, you, you're you taking care of booty ball. That's fine. We can run, you know, we've been set, setting up plays for Dane. Dane's been able, I don't think, has he missed a shot uh, in the tournament yet? I, I don't think so. Uh, free throws, sure. But, you know, we can have Terrence do his transition game. Uh, I'm very appreciative of the IO Kofi years. And, you know, when Kofi was the main focal point, because, you know, he's arguably the best big man um, in our history, but those teams could only play a certain way. So they were very simple and easy to game plan against. And when those guys weren't making their outside shots, a la Loyola, we had no counterattack. There's nothing we can do. This team is completely different. This team 
we we have three or four different ways that we can beat you and not just as backups like we have three four styles that illinois is genuinely comfortable playing and can play at a very high level i mean terrence he can beat you at all three levels he can beat you near the rim he can get to a spot in the mid range and he can dice you that way or he'll just launch a three pointer he'll make it and he'll go about his business Oh, and by the way, he's also the fastest fast break guy I've ever seen in an Illini uniform. Sorry, D. Brown. But it is just so difficult to game plan against that guy. I mean, I look at it like the Cleveland Cavs years of LeBron James, like his first stretch with the Cavs, where if somebody was like, oh, man, but I think they can stop Antoine Jameson, uh, the Orlando Magic can. It's like, oh, cool, but we still have LeBron James. So <laughs> that's defend that yeah. and good luck so that's why i'm very like this team is so different than any Illini team i've ever seen because we never had an athlete like Terrence shannon with that size and i i think i might be willing to say it that Terrence shannon is the best Illini basketball player of all time like it, it might sound crazy but you look at the 2005 team that was a team effort you look at the 1989 Flying Illini, there wasn't that one particular player that was head and shoulders above everyone else. Deion Thomas has a scoring record, yes, but did he have the winning? No. And you look at this Terrence Shannon team. Mark Stomask is a great player, yes. But Terrence Shannon has elevated a team more than I've ever seen an Illini athlete elevate his counterparts. And I don't know if I have an argument with you. You know, it's uh, it's definitely something we can go and discuss more in depth at some point. But I don't think it's arguable that Terrence has had the best season, individual season, that Illini, Illini has ever had. I mean, he scored more points than anybody, in, and he missed six games. You know, it's just been incredible. And he, he performs on the defensive side, too. Like, you know, he, a lot of the times we put the task on him to take on the opposition's best defender, and he does an admirable job of it. And, you know, again, there's nothing more we can ask for this guy to do, and he just comes through every single time. Check it out. Seven says, Brad is building a program, not just a winning team. Although greed is good, the 2024 Illini look like they can compete with anybody. Uh, I agree. You know, it's we've said this before. I think I've kind of mentioned it before. On our best night, we can absolutely win the national championship. If all the facets of our game are playing to their max capabilities, and I mean that to, you know, two weeks from now, if we potentially play UConn, uh, it's Iowa State, you know, showdown on Thursday night. If we meet Purdue for a third time, like all these teams, yeah, we're not going to be favored. And Iowa State, I think, opened up as a two and a half point yeah. favorite against us. But if all the facets to this Illinois team are performing the way we know they can, as check it out, said, we can compete with anybody. I mean, Stephen Bardo in our preseason show said Final Four. That's the uh, ceiling of this team. And it's taken a long time in the weirdest journey possible to get Illinois to its final boss like form. If you're going to use a video game reference, but they finally have. And that's with Terrence Shannon's 30 point outputs that are seemingly like candy right now. Um, he, it's that easy to get. Um, and then Marcus Damask with the way he's playing and um, his multitudes of scoring, like, his fadeaway jumpers, that's turn fadeaway jumper is deadly. There's not a lot of guys that can stop that. And the way he's able to utilize the post against smaller defenders. I mean, I looked at Iowa State against Washington State. And I'm like, Marcus Damask can kind of eat in this game. And so can Terrence Shannon. So I, I love the way that this team has been built. And the ceiling of it is just the highest I've seen since 2005 and maybe even a little higher with the with the at with the athletic athleticism of Terrence Shannon Jr. 
We have uh, 23 people watching. Feel free to chime in in the comments if you got anything to say. To let us know how you're feeling. Uh, again, it's a huge load off our backs, I feel like. Um, I don't know if you agree with me when I say this, Austin, but it feels like at this point we're kind of uh, playing with house money when it comes to the rest of the season. Um, of course, I'd like to win on Thursday. Whether we do or not, you know, uh, we'll we'll find out on Thursday. But, but again, the mood is nice right now. And to kind of circle back on your point, you know, talking about Domask, it's like if you shut down the booty ball aspect of his game, he's a three-level scorer. You know, early on, or earlier in the season, he was struggling with that three-point shot. Now, when he throws it up there, I have confidence that it's going to go in. So again, you know, it kind of goes back to that point we were making earlier. Both Shannon and Domask are three level scores. And again, most teams are grateful if you have one. That's going to be your best player and the guy that you kind of count on to lead your team to victory. Illinois not only has two of them, but two very good ones. And oh, it's... Sure. You know, again, Iowa State, it's going to be – I haven't done much research on them, and obviously, uh, as Austin said, we'll be doing a preview um, shortly uh, in the next day or two that we'll release. But a great defense stops a great offense, sure. That's the common adage. But we're still going to score, and Iowa State's really going to have to figure out a way to get to 80 85 points uh, in order to uh, stop us, I think. And I don't know if they're capable of doing that. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, I mean, I've seen them have extremely great offensive outputs against number one seed Houston. Um, at times, uh, this is the last five scoring outputs uh, for Iowa State. Um, they won 69-41 against Houston. Uh, they won 76-62 against Baylor and then 76 57 against Kansas state. I mean, I, I think Illinois will be able to score even with that extremely great defense that Iowa state has. I just feel like Illinois is too much of a bear on offense. And I feel like this Illinois team is a little bit different where you hear the term defense travels. I think this offense travels just because of the myriad of ways that Illinois can exploit a defense even how good it is. I mean, you look at the Golden State Warriors, like you hear the arguments back when the uh, um, back when the Golden State Warriors were doing their thing, you heard like, oh, but wait, if you would see how the 2004 Detroit Pistons go up against the Golden State Warriors, they would shut them down. I'm like, not in today's era, guys. Like offense is the avenue of victory. And that's why I think Illinois will win this game. Like I spoiler it on, on a prediction that we, that we may have. But I think Illinois just offensively is that dog right now, and nobody can touch that dog at the moment. Justin knows ball. Justin Verdon says, hit that like button, guys. We got 31 people uh, watching uh, across all platforms, and uh, we have uh, five likes right now. So let's, uh, let's up that up a little bit. Austin and I, our goal uh, has been to try to hit the 500 subscriber mark by the end of the college basketball season. Uh, we've got an extra couple days that uh, we weren't sure we were going to have um, with the victory yesterday. So do us a favor, hit that like button, share it with a fan of uh, the Illini. Help us grow our channel. Um, you know, just Austin and I really enjoy doing this. And, you know, once we when we see that, you know, people are watching, it just makes it easier for us to come on um, and uh, record. But. I mean, do you want to talk about the Duquesne game at all? There's not much to talk about. Like, I guess the only point I wanted to make about it is it's nice that this game was never in doubt. Yeah, it reminded me a lot of the UW-Milwaukee game in 2005, that Sweet 16 game, like where a surprise team comes out. You probably thought you were going to play BYU, but you play Duquesne and Illinois in 2005 probably thought they were going to play other teams, not UW-Milwaukee. Um, under the direction of Bruce Pearl. But Illinois dominated that game in 04 or 05. And this game, uh, they didn't let the Cinderella get anything going. There was no lead changes at all. Uh, score was tied once, and that was at 0 0 to start the game. So just complete domination from start to finish. It was never in doubt. That's what you want to see from a dominant teams against inferior competition. And 
that is exactly what happened in this game. Uh, Terrence Shannon, nobody can compete with him. Um, you looked at the other guys on this roster, um, all contributed 10 points from Quincy, 11 from Coleman, 22 from Marcus, and uh, 30 from Terrence Shannon. So just uh, unreal uh, performances by all of those guys. And I think that's, I think one guy that's going to be the X factor, again, we'll get to an Iowa State preview is Coleman Hawkins. Haven't discussed him yet in this podcast, but I think Coleman is going to be a guy that's going to be a extremely hard matchup for Iowa State. Yeah, coming into the game against Duquesne, I was very, very confident. You know, I from the tape that I did watch that uh, folks had sent me, I thought that Moorhead State was a better basketball team than Duquesne was. Duquesne just happened to get hot at the end of the year, you know, but they did have 11 losses on the season. They weren't, I think they finished fourth or fifth in their conference. They just yeah, happened they were 10 to 10 and 8 in the Atlantic 10. Right. And again, Atlantic 10 is a solid basketball conference, but we're not talking about any sort of top tier conference. They just happened to get hot in the tournament. What I was worried about was whether this whole stigma with uh, Illinois, they're going to put a little too much pressure on themselves on performing and, you know, what for Brad and for the team itself. uh, And they would have come out flat against Duquesne uh, in the round of 32. And that's not what happened at all. And again, that's kind of why I'm liking this team more and more every single day. It was a game where four minutes into the game, essentially that first TV timeout, the game was over. Everyone watching that game could kind of relax. The other game, you know, the previous uh, Moorhead State, it was a one-point game at halftime. And I, you know, I was getting the text messages, hey, are you worried? Are you worried? Are you concerned? Here we go again. I was like, not really. This is just kind of what Illinois does. We've been doing it seemingly all season long. Check in with me with, uh, you know, five, six minutes left in the game. And by then we were up, I think, 18, 19 points, and the game was in hand. We didn't play around this time. This time it was simply one of those, hey, you know, thank you for, you know, joining us here in the round of 32, but we're bigger than you, we're stronger than you, we're faster than you. Um, We're going to go ahead and uh, close this game out because we have to start game planning uh, for the next game. And you know, credit to the Illini this year for, you know, just doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Absolutely. And uh, check it out. Seven um, had his comment, all these close games and comebacks this year could bode well for the Illini. Yeah. Like the big 10 tournament, I always like to call it the pop quiz of the NCAA world where it's like, okay, you're going to be put in various different situations. Let's see how you react. And Illinois has done a great job of reacting to those, Uh, thus far and I think in this final exam like against Iowa State and against UConn if Iowa State pulls out to a 12 point lead at one point I I'm not going to be that nervous because we've seen it against Wisconsin we've seen it against uh, Ohio State we've seen it against Nebraska where they have came back at all facets so I I am not going to be just extremely just scared um, at that at those moments yeah, I and mean, we have shown over the past month that we can take the other team's best punch. We, you know, and that includes the Big Ten tournament, as you were talking about. You're talking about three or four quad one games where we were down by double digits at some point. But there was no thinking on my part, like, oh, this game is over. It's like, no, we're going to make a run, and then we'll see what happens. Um And as you said, same thing that's going to happen on Thursday. If Iowa State comes out shutting us down, uh, in particular in the beginning of the game, they have a lead of, you know, 7 to 12, 13 points. My eyes are still going to be glued on that TV because I know we're going to make a run at some point. Um, This team doesn't back down from adversity, which I think last year's team kind of did. And I don't know if that's just because of the youth that was uh, asked to do a lot on the teams uh, last year. This team just cherishes it. They know they take it possession by possession. And, you know, again, we put the pressure on the other team to keep up with us when it comes uh, to offensively. We'll go three, four minutes without scoring. It seems to happen. It happened a little bit too often uh, a month, month and a half ago. But those remaining 35, 36 minutes, we, it's just an onslaught that uh, we put on you. And, you know, we went toe to toe with Purdue in that game. It's like there's, 
Iowa State's no Purdue. So it, it, I don't know. It's, go, it's going to be a good uh, game. I, I big, talked about Purdue just because Brad mentioned. Sorry, uh, Austin. Do you think there's a chance Utah State beats Purdue today? No. <laughs> no. Nobody can compete with Edie right now until you get to a big boy or a cohesive team effort like a Houston or or another great team. I, I don't think that any of these smaller schools know how to deal with Edie and the shooting that they added this year. Uh, compared to last year's team, where they couldn't make couldn't buy a three point shot, we've uh, we've gotten pretty lucky with how the bracket has turned out this uh, this year in particular. Purdue got just as lucky as we did. It seems every team that I thought could maybe somewhat put up a challenge on their end has uh, is gone from the tournament. So I think Purdue's cakewalking at the very least to the Final Four. Um, check it out. To, says, oh, sorry. Going back to check it out's point um, about close games and comebacks. Yeah, I think the game that will be very vital to Illinois' experience this year was that Illinois Indiana game where they won seventy to sixty two. Very low scoring game for the Illini, but still found a way to win that game. I think it, that Iowa State game could be a lot very similar to this game. So I think the fact that Illinois won a game where they weren't scoring 93 points uh, is going to be extremely vital for this game against Iowa State. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I just got to watch more Iowa State tape, which I probably will now thank you to YouTube TV, which it just lets you record every game. Um, that's exactly how I have it for the tournament. Uh, I mean, I watched glimpses of the game yesterday against, uh, who was it, Washington State, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they looked good. But Washington State kept it close in that first half, and they just didn't really have an answer in the second half. And but obviously, I mean, they also beat Houston pretty badly for um, the Big Twelve championship. And Houston's a team that I've always held as pretty at pretty high regard. So you know, again, I I want to give them their credit, and you know, there'll be a show where we can just kind of do a little bit more of a deep dive to Iowa State, but this one's just more kind of, uh, you know, waking up in the morning and just kind of being appreciative and just kind of reflect back on the season that we've had so far and how now, you know, our season's not over. This is not a season recap show. This is a simply, hey, we've reached another level. Let's talk about it. All you look right. at uh, this UConn Northwestern game. Uh, going on today are you cheering for northwestern to beat uconn yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely no doubt about it um do i think they will no but you know if boo booey has a becomes a marquee name of the tournament you know that happens every year there's always one or two guys um you know i my guess this year was going to be either boo booey or tominaga and obviously nebraska was the first team in the Big Ten to not advance uh, in this tournament. But, yeah, I know there's a natural rivalry there with Northwestern. Of course there is. But, I mean, UConn is, you know, that's someone we potentially will, are going to have to face um, on, what well, I guess it would be Saturday. And that's a team that can match up with anybody. They got good players literally at every position, at every size. And that's, you know, if I can avoid playing them, I'll do it. I, I, I'll take our chances against Northwestern. Absolutely. I mean, and they would have to still get by San Diego State more than likely as well. So um, that would be another hard matchup for the Northwestern Wildcats with how injured they are. Um, but, yeah, this is just fascinating to see how the Big Ten has performed versus the likes of the SEC as well. So kudos to the Big Ten for rallying around this year um, and having – how many teams four or five in the second weekend um that's pretty incredible yeah unfortunately wisconsin um kind of fizzled uh they really yeah. didn't put up a fight in their game which was a little disappointing nebraska i kind of understand just because you know it was their first time in the limelight their first game um they were just outmatched but wisconsin was a strong favorite you know a number five seed and they were down 15-4 uh, in the first few minutes of that game, and it really yeah. never got that much closer. And that's a, that's just 
not something you'd be very happy about if you're a Wisconsin Badger fan. And I've already seen it. Folks wondering whether guards uh, going to be coming back next year. Again, another reason to appreciate Brad Underwood uh, even more. Absolutely. Check it out. It says bracket help is the best. The Illini earned it with three seed. Yeah. I mean, you would think we haven't had a lot of bracket help in the last couple of years. <laughs> Uh, some would say we got the short end of the stick. So finally, I'm not going to apologize to anybody for having to beat a, you know, a 14 seed to get into the Sweet 16. No, it it is what it is. You know, it's 50 50. A lot of uh, a lot of the success in a tournament has to do with this bracket luck, and you the had, fact that we got the better end of the team, this year. Yeah. Fine, thank you. Yeah, you had a team in Arkansas last year that had four or five NBA players that would be drafted. Um, you had Houston. That was a matchup nightmare with all of their wings that Brad tried to replicate a little bit um, with how he built the subsequent year's team. Yep. Um, you had a extremely underseeded Loyola team um, that would take on the number one seed in the second round. So this year, um, I, I think the tide has turned a little bit. I think uh, Illinois has paid their karma gods, uh, um, with these previous year's matchups? This is an interesting question, Austin. I, I don't know your answer. I'm rooting for all the Big Ten teams until they face the Illini. I I used to be like that, um, but then I realized, oh, it's not helping the net at all of the Big Ten, so I want to cheer against them because there could be a recruit that Illinois is competing with Wisconsin for something. And if Wisconsin makes a sweet 16, then they have a great chance of landing that recruit based on the previous success of the free previous year. So I always like to see big 10 teams exit a little early uh, that way. So it's uh, um, Illinois is the shining star of the league. So any Midwest recruit or transfer is watching is like, you know what? That's the school I want to go to in this conference. So uh, you asked me the question, then let me uh, ask you, who are you rooting for, UConn or Nor Northwestern? Um, I Well, this one directly affects Illinois in a way. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I will be cheering for Northwestern um, in this game because if you take – if UConn is no longer a factor, then that the percentages that Illinois makes a Final Four mm -hmm. rise so much if they take care of business against Iowa State. Yeah. I guess my answer is like, I don't know. There's something in me that I just, I do like it when the Big Ten uh, in itself does well. Uh, it's your facts and logic are completely sound and you're right. You know, when Michigan State does well, well, Illinois goes head to head with Michigan State for a lot of recruits and to kind of be able to show that we've gone further than them in tournaments or talk about Michigan State, you know, not performing well in tournaments that's that's a recruiting point that you and your staff can have um but by and large I, I still think i'm still on that boat in the sense where i like it when the big 10 does well just for national perception but the more i think about it and i'm talking myself out of it with the way college sports is going to be looking uh moving forward essentially just being a power two we're going to have those built-in advantages. We don't really need to build up the Big Ten anymore because the dollars and cents already are. So moving forward, I think there's an opportunity for me to just kind of focus more on my happiness with being with the Illini uh, succeeding well. But right now I'm still, you know, it's it's nice for us because, you know, I have a lot of people were saying the Big Ten was down this year. And then we won our, I think I, we won our first four games, um, which was nice. And I'm assuming Purdue takes care of business today. I, I'm not quite as optimistic for Northwestern. But uh, the only time that I do say I will cheer for a Big Ten team is if they were to be in a national championship or a Final Four. Uh, because at that point, I want, Ellen, I want the Big Ten to ha get that monkey off their back of not having a national champion since 2000. I feel like that is one thing that is holding the Big Ten back a little bit perception-wise is to not have one of their teams hold up the trophy at the end of the year. So once it gets to that point where it doesn't really matter um, about perception and it's it's all about uh, Big Ten actually having a bragging rights, I turn into like that SEC-style football fan where they're changed. <laughs> SEC, SEC. 
<laughs> yeah, check it out. It says, plus other fans are pretty brutal, i.e. Purdue, heart to root for them. Yeah, I'm certainly not rooting for that fan base. Um, but the Purdue team itself, uh, you know, has a is a pretty likable bunch. There's Matt Painter's never done anything which uh, makes me, in particular, dislike him. Uh, you know, I I have a pretty decent relationship with some Purdue content creators out there, so you know, I wouldn't mind seeing them happy. But as some of you may have seen, like you know, at the end of our game against Purdue, a lot of their contingent uh, showed up in our feed and weren't exactly the most humble of bunch. So. I guess the only way for me to like Purdue is a different animal. Purdue is one of those teams where if they win, you know, sure, go Big Ten. But if they lose, I don't think I'm necess- I don't think I'm gonna be shedding any tears over it. No, I'm going to laugh in the face of every Purdue Boilermaker fan if they <laughs> lose to Utah State today. I mean, that would just be Chef's Kiss perfect <laughs> ending to this weekend. I mean those guys are just insufferable. They are an insufferable bunch. And I'm sure they say the same thing about Illinois fans, but my goodness, I wish nothing but the worst in terms of on-court success and on-field success for the university. That's going to about wrap it up for us today. Uh, Again, we're going to have an Iowa State preview out in probably the next day or two. And uh, I think I'm also going to do a little recap episode about the women's basketball team which uh, whose season I think could potentially end in the next day or two as well we'll uh, bring on a guest for that again on your way out if you don't mind hit that subscribe button hit that like button for us it's really going to help us out we've got we're up to 13 likes we appreciate that we've got about 34 people watching on uh, all the different platforms so we appreciate your company this morning Austin any final thoughts uh, no, go Illini in the WBIT, the Women's Basketball Invitational Tournament. Illinois takes on Stony Brook uh, today at 2 p.m. on ESPN+. Plus. Definitely. Uh, we'll, we'll be watching that game. I'll try to find it at least. Uh, if you're by the State Farm Center, go support Shauna Green's team. I think, you know, uh, while they had a little disappointing of a year this year, obviously uh, compared to our recent past and really long-form past, I'm really excited about what she's doing with that program and if you guys honestly show more interest in it i don't mind producing more content and uh, talking about that basketball team moving forward but for now uh, i'm going to bid you all adieu and uh, we will see you sometime uh, later this week take care guys all right